hello can you hear me tony illa illa father good morning collins collins good morning good morning from sacred heart college good morning father father yes uh, you can I'm, you can turn around father a I little will. bit you can, yeah yeah, yeah. I, i'm towards your right yes father yes this is my actual position yes and all yes go down go down you said sir uh, you can adjust your screen for the laptop screen towards you you can bend it towards you so that there will be a better focus yes i have not uh, got mine fully yeah i'll enlarge it hmm? yes father yes, yes. now i am uh, yes Hello. father you are right do you want me to come closer yes father yes okay and uh, I think you can fly, slightly adjust your uh, lighting also. Hi, sir, hi. Anthony Sami sir, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Collins. Sir, you can uh, just uh, tell father how, about uh, how to. I think there should be a bit, bit more lighting to his face. Just... I, I understand. I think yeah. he is sitting in his room. I will talk to him. Yes, oh. father, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Father. Yes, he said. No, I can't become much brighter. I am like that. <laughs> okay okay then um, you uh, may I'm switching on the light yes yeah ah this is better ah no much better yeah okay i i think you can remain in the same position and uh, keep talking yes With your aud- your audio is good now good thank god good morning sir good morning sir good morning ma'am Mr Francis will join we are waiting sir ah uh, i told him to join now he is ready almost ready ready oh, yeah kedi francis okay. Okay. <laughs> he will talk with the american accent okay that's fine so then i will uh, play the uh, promo Let yeah, it go yeah. on. I will admit. Yes, uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, admit, uh, Mr. Collins. Yes, sir. Uh, one uh, Dr. Joe Durayraj from Gandhi Gram will join. Please, sure, sir. Sure, sir. Oh, sure. 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 Please. Sure, sir. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Thank you, sir. <laughs>
அதே லிங்க் தான் அதே லிங்க் தான் நான் அனுப்புறேன் ஓகே வாட்ஸ்அப்ல அனுப்புறோம் ஹலோ குட் மார்னிங் ஒரு <laughs> Dr. Yes, Moses Talwin? Sir, he is online. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hi, Larry. Welcome, welcome, Larry. Professor Arul Das is here. Dr. Moses Talwin from Zambia is here. Uh, Dr. Anthony Zame, Laila, Professor and Head is here. the resource person professor reverend dr francis peter is here Dr. Chalve, Dr. Chalve is online. Uh, I'm going to take a look at this. Sir, good morning. Collins. Collins, you called me? Sir, uh, uh, Kadirasan sir wanted to talk, I mean, welcome Dr. Moses Chalve. He is okay, on, okay. but he, oh, has yeah, muted, yeah. he has muted himself. You can also welcome him. Dr. Okay, Dr. Yes. Dr. Chalve is online. He is yeah. there. Dr. Moses Chalve? Good morning, Doctor. How are you? Fine. Good morning. Nice to see you. Pleasure is all mine. It's it's nice to be here. Yeah, morning we have a wonderful lecture from uh, Father Dr. Reverend uh, Francis Peter. You are welcome for that lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Moses Solvay, this is Professor Anthony Sami. I extend a warm welcome to you. Thank you so much, Doctor. He is one of the coordinators of this international conference. wonderful dr francis peter is here reverend doctor you can say hello to him he is the resource person of the day former professor from st joseph a renowned good scholar good throughout good india good morning doc good morning professor how are you good morning dr moses and welcome welcome and delighted to see you here thank you so nice. much sir blessed it's a pleasure to be here i'm so grateful nice nice having you good I hope we will have continued interactions. Is the yeah. audio clear? Can you see and hear? Yes, Father. Yes, okay. clear, Father. No, it's Mo- Dr. Moses can Father, hear. Father, Father, many of your old students have joined today to listen to you, Father. Oh my uh, God. We are admitting everyone. Uh, the request was placed yesterday and today morning. Many, many of your students are coming in, Father. Dr. Kadiresan, you have made my day. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope it will be up to some expectations. You, you are responsible for the gate crash today. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you have always had a good number. It has been... Yeah, yeah, we have been... The problem was to, you have to do the gatekeeping. Cutting off people, asking them to come to, come to let's say, 
uh, YouTube. They are all pouring over. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's really nice. Hmm, I can see. Mr. Collins. Yeah. Sir, listening, sir. Yes, sir. Just give me one minute to, to unmute my video. Dr. Collins, sir, back to sir. you. I'm just to go to the waiting room. Yes, sir. No problem. Yeah. Uh, you, the moderator sir. is here. I think the moderator has joined for the. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank he you. Has joined, but he has, he is yet to get connected. I'm just waiting for him. Uh, yeah. actually, he is also in a village now. <laughs> That's a problem. No, he he came, but he not at not at uh, connected to the main room. Okay. Uh, Let I'm me mute waiting. myself and go to the waiting room, Dr. Collins. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, I find out from Mr. Francis if he has any difficulty. Yes, sir. I think he's going through. I think he's having some difficulty in connecting. For a long time, it's, it's yeah, still there. Yeah, he, he was trying. He has not joined the maid room. Uh, we'll just find out. Neither join Pandinia, Pandinia. Join on Pandicha, the couple of our Latin. Continue, continue, time. Video, video, you can unmute and. Uh, Join us without video. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. I takes time. It was it was oh, oh. Mr. Collins. Sir, listening, sir. Listening. Uh, I spoke to Mr. Francis. Yes, sir. Uh, he could see uh, Father Arikaraj's uh, Zoom room, uh, and it is taking time, it seems. Maybe he has a little connectivity issue. He is our LMS. Sir? Sir? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Francis, he is a tech savvy only. But the problem is the human... yeah, connectivity. Yeah, connectivity. It was raining last night, it seems. But he will... uh, Don't worry, I am there always. Don't worry. No problem, sir. Collins. Professor? Sir? Professor? Sir? Professor? Sir? Professor? Sir? Professor? Sir? Listening, sir. Listening, sir. Is it okay, the place where I am sitting? Yes, yeah, check. <coughs> yes, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Light background and all that. Eh? Sir, sir, you, you can, can move slightly towards mm. left. Towards your, your left. Come on, let me talk to the Okay. Because uh, if I keep it proper. Professor, Professor Anthony, sir. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so, Madam Sujata, Madam is here. Yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Namrata, the resource person of the last day, is here. Yes, we will yeah. welcome all of them. Yeah, yeah, Professor. Yeah, Professor. We extend a warm welcome to all the resource persons and the participants. Participants. Yeah. And a special welcome to Dr. David J. Berlin. Good morning, yeah. sir. <laughs> <laughs> He's the spirit of all our happiness. Hello. Uh, a very good morning to all of you. Good Looking morning. forward to a wonderful morning, session. And... So good morning, Namrata. Good morning, madam. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you. The Collins, is it okay? Sir, you can a little bit uh, adjust your laptop, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yes, yes. Sir. Now it's okay, yes. sir. Perfectly it's perfectly okay. right. Okay, yeah. Okay, sir. Ah. And now I enough, enough, change. enough, sir. Enough, enough, sir. I won't change it till the end of the day, huh? <laughs> <laughs> 
ஐ மே மோ ஐ மே மோ பட் நாட் த லேப்டாப் ஆல் தி பெஸ்ட் ஃபார் எவ்ரி ஒன் ஆல் ஆஃப் யூ Francis went up player Tony he is trying to get into the thing yeah. okay he is in touch with you then okay. yeah 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 and he'll be there the moder- the moderator is 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 here we'll oh, check okay okay we'll please check his- yeah yeah please. i'll ch- ask him to unmute sir uh, i'm we are checking his video and audio please uh hello hi good morning francis francis okay hello sir hello yeah yeah yes yes francis he is there uh... hello uh, yes, sir can you hear me sir sure yeah yeah we yeah, are able to speak speak so maybe the, the video i so, so maybe the video i'll uh, my camera i'll cancel it so i can have good bandwidth sure okay so am i audible sir yes francis okay. now oh yes sir sir regarding this uh, form feedback form yeah uh, what's that sir like a uh, frequent announcement list of frequent announcements and uh, will we be getting uh, questions from the chat or whatsapp or uh, how do we get uh, you can see the chat room when the presentation is going on uh, professor uh, yes, yes sir at the same time, at the, same time uh, the team will also help you with questions they will also provide you with questions and that will come through whatsapp huh? yeah 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 okay uh dr professor joseph duraraj has joined us anna welcome good morning na. good morning na dr jo he is not muted yeah i, I so have we have to unmute we have, have to unmute professor collins please unmute uh, dr joseph duraraj professor yes sir yes sir please, yes sir yes sir i am on yeah joseph professor you are given and uh, he was francis uh, yeah sometime vice ah, chancellor for okay. the gandhigram university and it's a great um, privilege to have a great scholar of uh, uh, and professor raj sir he is online he is online sir yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah okay okay uh, now welcome na thank you thank you dr jo welcome professor thank Andrew you sir. thank you dr tony thank you dr kadrisan thank Good you morning, dr david hey, balan Good morning father peter is there you can say hello to him oh where is he yeah he is there father good morning father father peter good morning uh good morning can you hear me uh i don't know can you hear uh, now oh yeah, yes yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> i can see you and i can also <laughs> <laughs> actually i i thought i should uh, take a little bit of rest uh, i'm at the beach hi Yeah, we can see you on the seaside. Yes. <laughs> Father Peter, welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Father Maria. Thank you. Good And morning, uh, Dr. Joe Dureraj, welcome. Good yeah, morning. Good morning, about... Father. Ah. Good morning. Welcome. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Unmute for us, all right. Thank you. There was a conversation over here. They might unmute for now. Father, Dr. Moses Shalvey is here. Dr. Damrata. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good morning, uh, sir. Sir, here, Dr. Sujata Menon is there. Good morning to all of you. Yeah, he's nice, very nice here. Nice to have all of you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dr. Collins? Sir, listening. Sir, listening. Uh, yes, Mr. Sir. Francis wants his mic to be unmuted. Sir, yes, sir. So that he is ready. Time also is 10. Yes, yes. Sir, just a minute. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'll do it. Yeah. Sir, ask him to unmute, sir. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. Yes, he is. He yes, is sir. He is yeah. ready. Oh, yes, sir. He is ready. Francis. 
Ah, yes, sir, yes, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, yeah, yeah we are able to hear you. Oh, that's good, sir. Yes, sir. Any time, any time we may start now. Stop screen, Kuna. Stop screen. Hello? So we can start. Okay. Uh, sir? Francis? Yes, sir. Please tell me, sir. Yeah, you may start. Anytime now? Yes. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. And of course, I won't say good night because we have an interesting session and an enthusiastic resource person who is going to fire you up. So stay tuned. I'm Francis Xavier, Assistant Professor of English, Loyola College, Chennai. Writer. Welcome, dear participants, to the third day of the international webinar and to the session Forensic Linguistics for Industry 4.0, which is tricky. However, simple statements you can make when you are in an argument with your, you know, the obvious outcome. Both of you, and Henry II was said to have exasperatedly uttered, will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? Whereupon four of his knights set out to assassinate the troublesome Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Beckett. Did he really mean that? Well, that's why we have forensic linguistics helping us to understand the context better. Forensic linguistics, the branch of applied linguistics that deals with the language and the law, is about knowing how the language operates in the context of law. And it is about the functions of the language and its various interpretations and implications of legal discourses. And how do we apply that to the context of Industry 4.0, especially amidst the transforming smart technologies that communicate with each other without any how to understand plagiarism and trademark disputes, or how to understand the internet of things and the internet of systems, especially from the forensic linguistic perspectives. As you are, I'm also more uh, eager to learn from Reverend Dr. Peter M. Francis H.J., who is currently a professor of Ma managerial communication at XLRI. He had Davis College, Palim Coating, Secretary and Correspondent of Loyola College, Chennai, and Adjunct Professor of Liba. English language reigning passion as evidenced by inner project on self-access learning, 46 books and a number of journal articles, as well as over 550 ELT seminars and workshops conducted at virtually every state of the country. On the invitation of the Ministry of Community Development and Social Inequality, Sri Lanka, Commission of in Myanmar, training and advising planners in these countries on issues of education. His many years of association with the British Council in Sydney to London, where he acquired a master's in teaching of English, and 12 years as an accredited overseas examiner and examiner trainer for the Cambridge University's suite of exams had honed and increase his passion for empowering with the language of upward mobility. In collaboration with I design, deliver a module for improving language proficiency and test some 300 scholars from across the country. He assisted the Jharkhand Education Project Council in designing and administrating a state level recruitment test. The international appointed him peer reviewer from 2019, and he has also successful language projects to his credit. It's a great honor to welcome our resource person to deliver his address. Over to Reverend Dr. Peter M. Francis A.J. Thank you, KD. Thanks a lot. Well, I'm afraid you can't get rid of this turbulent priest, at least for not for one more hour. Okay, so stay put. Okay. Right, without further ado, I just want to tell you, friends, and welcome you to this little webinar 
I am excited about what I am doing today. But I know, I know you must have heard every speaker begin his talk with I am excited. But believe me, I am excited. That's because I have really thought of something new. I have been trying something. And ever since Anthony Sami gave this title, Redefining Language and Literary Studies, I've been thinking about it. What are we doing? Repeating. There are two types of people. I tell people during my trainings, uh, you must pardon me this. There are people who are called repeaters and others who are called feeders. Well, um, sorry for that uh, pun. And then the real one is what we can we not become somebody who would do something interesting, interesting with our studies. And therefore, I was thinking of starting and thinking about something that is different and that is, uh oh, I'll get my. Oh, yes. I'm showing my screen. I hope you'll be able to see that. Yes. I guess you are able to see this. This is my topic, deception detection with forensic linguistic and industry four requirement. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. Yes, he said. Now, why are we doing this? We have been taught linguistics. Yes. I don't know how many of us remember what we are taught. We must have been taught the great vowel shift. We must have been taught something about uh, loan words, foreign words, and about uh, phonetics. I don't know, plosives, fricatives. Yes, of what earthly use is it now? Why are we doing what has been always done? Can we not do something different, better? That is what I've been thinking. And that's why this topic, thinking out of the linguistic box. And uh, here is the TOC, the table of contents for us. Okay, now, first let us try to understand what this Industrial Revolution 4 require of us educationists. And then, basically I'm trying to say that there are two ends of the climb. One is the bread and butter end, and the other one is the mental formation. Until both of them are met, the course is of little use. Very many of us would like to do things which are exciting for ourselves, gives us the joy, the cognitive pleasure, you know, the fulfillment by teaching something. But the question is, is it relevant? Is it useful? That is what I'm talking about or hinting at in the second point. Is our content novel, relevant, rewarding, exciting, and make students job ready? If it doesn't fulfill these conditions, there is something that is lacking, interesting perhaps, but if it is not holistic, it won't fit the requirements of uh, the new world. <clears throat> and so I'm trying to explain this with linguistics. I'm trying to think out of the linguistic uh, box. Thinking out of the box requires two things. You must know the box. Only then you can think out of the box. What is the box and what does it confine us to? And that is what we are looking at. And then we are looking at behavioral analysis using the phonetics, the social linguistic profiling with verbal, nonverbal, etc. We, we'll, I promise you one thing: it will not be all lecture. It will be something that is different. Uh, now, some of the basic tenets, the caveats. If we want to change, this is what on the screen you can find. You cannot remain the same if you want situation to change. I believe. All of us from so many different places want a change. But if you want a change, we cannot remain what we are. And the second little one. And what are we doing? These are some little sayings that I have collected and trying to crystallize what I've been thinking. 
prepare for the future and not to fit the past. Just because we have the notes that we have assiduously taken from our professors, are we going to impose it on the students? Is this what they need? Prepare for the past or for the future, not the past. What is the future? We'll take a look at it soon. So the next line, yesterday's success could cause today's problems. That is a little controversial statement. It takes time to think it. Like the other famous statement, good is the enemy of the better. Because we do good, we hesitate to do something better, even think of something better. And that is what is stated there. And finally, <clears throat> these three things are coming up there, right? We have been doing what we have always been doing and don't expect that anything new will happen because of that, okay? That is what we want to say. Now, why do we change? Why do we have to change? And here is something that we come to. Oh, yes, I hope you are back to see me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess somewhere you must be able to see me, doesn't matter. Yes. Fine. What I'm trying to say is I'm just giving you two little stories. One of Kodak. You remember the name? Some of us would. Some at least who are in the 50s and above. Some others also can. Kodak was a photography company with a worldwide assertion. And in India, we had 1,75,000 employees. They were making roll films. We were making 120 ACM and 35 mm and so many things, X-ray films and others. Where are they? Gone. Shape up or ship up. The second example is our famous Nokia phone. Once that was the pride, owner's pride, you know the rest. Yes, Nokia was something. Now it is not there simply because they refused to move into Android or they preferred not to move. They lost, missed the bus and so they went off. We are facing a similar crunch, a little worry. If we do not, if we do not take cognizance of the changed ways that is coming up, we will become irrelevant. Very soon we will become irrelevant. Many of our higher educations will become irrelevant because they say, why, why are we doing this? Okay, uh, now I'll share you back that little, yeah, I think, now I'm putting down the problem. You can see the problem. We need to understand, I'm not explaining this too much, but I want you to understand just these things. In case we need, we need to have something larger than this to understand. But basically it says that uh, <clears throat> the current education is misaligned with the requirements of tomorrow's world. Yes, we are teaching something that is irrelevant. We put it in very simple terms. We need to anticipate the skills required by tomorrow's world and prepare today's students for that world. Are we doing it? Do we really want to? That's the question. And for that, we must unearth the map, the mental map that is within us. And we must look at the current mindset that shapes our thinking and our teaching and hold them to rigorous scrutiny. You do that, then you can think up. You understand the box if you want to think out of the box. And so, what would be the response? The response, to be sure, I'm saying that we must need to abandon the practice that has made us successful till now. Painful. <clears throat> Devastating. Nevertheless, very necessary. Abandon what we have been doing so far and thought was successful in order to embrace something even better. 
good is the enemy of the better. We have been good, but abandon it. Leaders of the future dare to be different. That is the call of the new world. And we shape up or we ship out. What do we teach? We teach them the skills and the abilities that the world requires. I'm just listing some of them that I come to know from my association with business and business engagements. We need to integrate learning and give them analytical skills. They need to have critical thinking. Application of what they have learned to real life. They need the charm of learning, the ease of learning. They need to learn to work in a team, teamwork, and communicate well. That's what we call the communicate competence. And they need to acquire also skills, knowledge and skills. They need to go harness well. Alertness, what I call the helicopter view of things. Not the myopic, not the standard one. We need to think big and we need to think different. We need to think and help them think out of the silos, not discipline after discipline, not in piecemeals, but not incremental, but bound beyond the boundaries of the existing system. Think new, think great, think better. That is what is needed. How do we approach this? I know this is very condensed, but still, we certainly have heard about systems thinking. That could be a possible answer. We are thinking in short myopic ways. We are thinking in piecemeals. Look at the system. There is something that connects everything and we must think helical. You know, helical, I think for us, from literature and others, it's not a very common word. I, I like to think of the, the circular staircase. You know, in a small compact space, we can put in so much of this, that kind of a thinking, a circular staircase, a helical structure that will encompass all these different things. Can we think differently? If you do that, we might, we might do something great. We need a new emerging pattern and respond to rather than react symptomatically. If we do that, we are going to really do great. That's what we are calling you to, my dear friends. And then, <clears throat> I'll let, let me now try to illustrate this with linguistics. I told you, we have been doing morphology, syntax, orthography, I don't know, loan words, all, all, all of these. Okay? But can we be a little more inclusive? Can we stretch? Can we think helical? Can we think out of box? Can we make linguistics useful for the students? Helping land a job. As of now, after doing our great linguistics, I think all they are fit for is to become a teacher. If at all, they teach linguistics. And there are faculty who come to the class and say, today's class is on phonetics and they are supposed to teach phonetics. Yeah, this happens. And that's all we do. They pass the exam. They acquire no skill. Can we stretch it and make it possible for them? And that is what we are trying to do today. And then we see, you know, we need to understand a large chunk of what is language, what is communication, how we understand, and shed certain ideas that language is meant to communicate. Not always. Language is meant to fudge, to hide. Prevaricate. Yeah, so many interesting things are really happening, and we need to understand. Or that language is somehow that is popping out. You cannot not communicate. Think about this sentence. You cannot not communicate. Every moment, everything you do is a communication, whether you speak with words or with word, written words or spoken words or gestures, you are communicating. Your silence is communication. You cannot not communicate. Can we extend the communication and liberate it from the shackles of what we call linguistics, linguistic syllabus? 
we need to think of that and you know and also understand that it is context that makes meaning not the words this is called the fallacy of textualism that the words and the syntax give us the meaning we know it is not sure it is not sure that supposing i say uh, hi friends all of you there kindly raise your hands you would but it has a different meaning in different context if i say this in a classroom <clears throat> it has got one meaning if a policeman says this to a possible suspect raise your hands that is a different context and there are so many other things if you agree with me concur with me raise your hands you know yeah so many other things are there or take this example well i I'll, 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 i'll think of this movie the peter sellers movie he is standing with a there's a dog there a stranger comes and he asks him does your dog bite and peter sellers says ah oh, no nah. and he smiles and walks and there the dog pounces on him and takes a big bunch of flesh from his posterior and he looks pathetically at him you said you didn't bite that's not my dog he says that's interesting you know the sentence is correct does your dog bite no it doesn't but then the context matters so much needs to be done and that is what we need to think about let me come back to what are the possible jobs that is available uh with the with this new kind of a thinking i'll just try to list out and he said now if this can be done why not we do something more okay here we are i'm looking at one angle only <coughs> can we use language to help solve and prevent crimes that's what kd had introduced uh, forensic linguistics as look at the career possibilities you need hr managers recruiters you might wonder why hr management hereafter is not just looking at your qualification those things can be done by an artificial intelligence by the computer ai can take over that what we need to understand is the person what is trying to do what kind of a person is he can he be trusted especially today the market says we are thinking of moving people out into we are trying to we are trying to move people out into the uh, home work nobody is going to come here and therefore we are trying to see if it is possible for them to be honest to be reliable to be trustworthy and we need people to be recruited give me people who can be trusted it is easy for me to appoint them because they are good in paper but will they deliver we have representative they say who are supposed to go to different places they take the car move it round park it in the next uh, next uh, street come back and sleep we need dependable persons hr manager recruiter sales manager sales manager we need people if i am trying to sell i can waste my breath but with one look at his eyes i know is this person going to buy or not we need to train and make it more effective intelligence agencies you know negotiators financial agencies cyber security there is a lot of problem there is and look at the situation that is multiplying there are ever increasing situations in these ones and i wanted to tell you there are three universities in this world which are introduced cyber linguistics they are using forensic linguistics as a full time course and a full time degree one in europe one in uk and one down south we need to think and catch up with them we need to switch on our headlights and not follow the tail lights of other cars before us be creative enough enough we have been just following the others blindly but perhaps it is now time to surge ahead switch on your headlights and now look at all this and it would still be interesting yeah uh, what are we basically doing language can be a 
as good as a signature. We can get more out of the written, spoken, and non-verbal communication than we can get out of a person's looks, the color, anything. We can get many information about him, for example, his nationality, his mother tongue, his culture, his education, what have you. Anything is possible, but if we can train him. That is what they say. Nobody knows they need a linguist, but everybody needs a linguist. There is a great need for linguists. I'll come to a little more of a, a, a practical one. We need acuity, strong visual. Now, please look at this one. We want attention to details. I'm going to give you a test. Here is an exercise, okay? You're going to read it and tell me what you saw, right? Okay, what was it? A bird in the bush? Really? Really? Ah, some of you have seen something else. Look out carefully now. Ah, there we are. There is two there. We missed it. We need people who have got equity. Okay, you missed the first one. Let us see if there is another one. I'm going to give you another one. I want you to count the Fs in the following text. Ready? Shall we? Here we go. How many Fs were there? Those who say three, raise your hands. Ah, I can't see. Ah, three of you, yeah. More than three, four, five? Ah, uh -uh. look carefully. Look carefully now. Read carefully. There are 10 Fs. Yeah, thank you. Did you find 10 Fs? If you did, congratulations. Yeah, what happens normally? The two letter words called off or three letter words called for is normally glossed over. This is the equity we need. We need to train our students about. And that is attention, looking at patterns. If you can train this, we will be able to look at this. You know, we are looking at nonverbal, paraverbal, the, the speech, the written, and the grammar. Okay. Fine. Some of us might say, well, you know, you know, we all do this. We can find out people who are bluffing. After all, we are all, most of us are married people. We know how people bluff, especially when they say we have come after a long meeting, there was an overtime. And we know what kind of an overtime it was. Yeah, but yes, research says that over 58% of the time, a human being can make a difference between the truth and falsehood. But the trouble is, chimpanzees can do as well. Look at this little quote. The success rate is virtually same. Can we not do better? Okay. Now, live spotting. We'll come to something else. We are looking at spelling, grammar, etc. Okay, I'm going a little fast. I know I'm behind time. Okay. We are looking at these things. I'm not going to read them. We can study the dialectal variations, the underlying native lang language structure, what is called uh, cross-cultural communication, and all those differences that we have with, uh, would be very easily done. Yeah. And then we have the patterns of error. All these are going to tell. Every writing of a person is transparently telling us something that can be amazingly revealing. Now, I'm going to give you a little clip. Watch this. The tips that I'm going to give you might apply to interrogations. You shouldn't really think of these videos as interrogations. So let's look at our first slide. This is a liar who is going to be interviewed. He's Tell me why you think he's a liar. That's all. Tips that I'm going to give you might apply to interrogations. You shouldn't really think of these videos as interrogations. So let's look at our first slide. Zach, it's really great to have you here today. I'm glad you could join us. We're going to go ahead and just have a very casual conversation. I'm just going to ask you an assortment of questions and just have you respond. Um, so first off, we're just going to jump right in. 
What is the worst job you've ever had, and why did you just like it? Um, the worst job that I've ever had was working at. A Look at that. Um, um, and he repeated the question. The worst job I ever had was a repetition of question is one sign that there is hesitancy. When we do an interview, we carefully pay attention to this hesitancy. That means they don't have really an answer. They are conjuring up an answer. And repeating the question is one way of delaying and prevarication. Okay. And there are other things also. Let me go a little faster and go to this one. You, if your boss gave you credit for someone else's work. You are the question is what happens if your credit if your boss credits you for someone else's work? I wonder what we would answer. I like to ask these questions, but if these questions were asked to me, I don't know. Okay, look at this answer. Oh my god. Okay. He used a couple of what we call qualifiers. I might just let it be. I mean, if I'm getting credit for someone else's work, maybe it'll help me grow to a place I need to be. He used a couple of what we call qualifiers. The word might, the word maybe. These are signs of uncertainty, and those can be signs of deception as well. So if you listen for particular words, hesitations and qualifiers tend to be more associated with deception than with truth. I'm, I'll uh, skip this, I'm sorry, but just lack of time. There's so much I've prepared for about two days workshop. Anyway, look at this one. If somebody says roundabout, we understand. Or instead he says a router. We take the router there and take the third exit. Then we know he's an American or the word for pavement. And did you know that if somebody says hajj, and somebody says H, there is a difference. I can find out whether he's a Protestant or a Catholic. That's interesting. In Northern Ireland, Catholics say H, it's called the Hebreno English. And the Protestants say H without aspiration. And well, we'll come to Hindi. I noticed that in Lucknow, people say for paper, not Kagaz, but Kagaj is what we hear. They say Kagaz. Z. So if you say Kagas, I know you are from Lucknow. There are telltale evidences coming out. You can look at a person and find out a lot. Okay. Now we listen to this famous, famous one. And I'll tell you what happened. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Miss Lewinsky. I never told anybody to lie. Not a single time. Never. These allegations are false, and I need to go back to work for the American people. Thank you. Let us just to analyze this. I'm going to say this again. What he's saying, trying to say is, he starts with what is called listen. That is called a call attention word. That is possibly an unto. This is not a spontaneous word. Listen. That increases or decreases the significance of what is going to happen. So that is carefully constructed. And there are other words like rather, very, and all these are called qualifiers. Qualifier is one giveaway about lying. And look at this second sentence. It is a very formal and it's very unlike Clinton. That's why we must compare the before and the after. He says, I did not have sexual relations with this woman. Normally, he would have said, I did it. That would have been normal. This is very formal. And he doesn't, it is very unlike him. And look at these words that he chooses. I did not have sexual relationship. The harsher words there are, assault, rape, whatever. They, they tone it down. They say that, no, it's not as bad as you think. You mild it. And then there is a distance. This is the fourth clue. Distance says, he said, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. It is a distinction. He did not say, you know, it's, it's somebody, something, supposing you want, you say that you didn't embezzle from company, from your company. And if you are not honest, you did not say my company, you say from the company. You will not have this ownership. You won't say our company, my company, you will say the. This is one way of distancing. 
And then one way, one last little clue I find here is repetition. I never, never, one never would have been fine. But he's trying to convince the listener. He's trying to shield himself. This is what is happening here. And that is what is the problem we have. With. Okay, I'm going to show you now some little letters. Oh, perhaps I'll skip this. Look at this one. This was a ransom note scribbled. And now we have transcribed and typed into it. Do you ever want to see your precious little girl? And you can see $10,000 in cash locket in a diaper bag, blah, blah. Now, this is all we have. My question would be, can you maximize intelligence yield from this one? Who is he? What is he trying to say? We think he is a person who is making spelling mistakes for can, cops, daughter. That means uh, he is not native speaker, right? This is deception. Why do I know it's a deception? Look at the first sentence. Do you want to see your precious little girl again? This is an authentic language of a native speaker. It doesn't come spontaneously. If a person can make so many mistakes, he wouldn't have made that then. And then there is another clue. You know, look at this word. Do you understand the word devil strip? I'll tell you what it is. Yeah, look at this. Devil strip is word used for what is in other place called country strip. Between the roads, there is a little grass strip, and that is called a country strip. But in one place, Akron, Ohio, is called Devil Strip. So when he read this, the great linguist, forensic linguist, simply said, in your suspect list, do you have a Native American educated person from Akron, Ohio? That's it. And it happened to be correct. Every little thing is popping out and is telling many things like this. Okay, I'm skipping this. Now look at this, this particular letter. Do you notice something that is bracketed in green and then in red? Some words are contracted, some are not. This is all. Does it strike us? These mechanics would matter. Some key phrases, terms, dialectal terms, this would be interesting. And then here, if we'll also look at that, he says in, in another conversation that follows this, he says, uh, then I left for, uh, for the restaurant. That is not normal. The more conventional way be, I then left. You know, these things will tell you who they are. A careful analysis would be interesting. Okay, this is a famous, famous one called Una Bomber. You know who is Una Bomber? Because he's, the name came because he bombed universities and airlines. UN for universities, A for airlines. So Una Bomber. And that is Ted Kaczynski. It has come out in a beautiful movie, very interesting. And he has got something there that is very, very telltale. Oh, can you see this particular one? As for the negative consequences of eliminating the society, etc., we can, can't eat the cake and have it too. To gain one thing is to sacrifice the other. He wrote a ransom note, and there is philosophy, rambling philosophy. But this one line betrayed him. Can you find something out there? I wish we were face to face. I'd like to see your faces. Anyway, do we say we can't eat the cake and have it too, or have the cake and eat it too? You see the reversal there? But this was the practice in a certain century, in a certain place, in a certain place. From this, this helped him and said, look for an intellectual, pedantic, possibly a Harvard graduate. And there he was. After a long time and so many bomb blasts, they caught him. It is possible to gain all of them. I'm not going to take you to too many things, but 
take a look at this. I'm collaging four little notes of a warning that came from somebody. Look at this, going to be a gas bomb here, this house. But it comes to you, what does it mean? They rake their brakes. Then came the next one, will be bomb, this house. Couldn't understand. And Jodie Foster, going to be bomb, gas bomb, this house. Now, we have only one way of approaching this. We look at it as a note, as a memo, as a letter. Could it be something else? Could it be poetry? Could it be a direction? Could it be something else? You kept on thinking and there came the answer when they placed it over the map of the location. That was Judy Foster's house. And then he says to be a gas bomb, this house. And in that area was the house. They went there, they found a person with a burden of unrequited love who was trying to do something, caught him, and it stopped. We need people who can think and who can do a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you another little story, perhaps before I. Uh, yes, two little stories and then it's done. There was an FBI story where a hardened criminal was suspect, was caught and interrogated, but he was an expert. Nothing would come out of him, nothing at all. They listened, they grilled. He was a past master. Oh, you should watch that. And then with this permission, they asked these three questions about the the instrument that he used for killing. It is not, he said he didn't commit. I'm innocent, but they used. If you had committed this crime, would you have used a gun? And after a pause, he said no. Next one, would you have used a knife? No. Would you have used an ice pack? Would you have used a hammer? Interesting. When he, they asked the question, would you have used an ice pack? Did they notice his eyes just dipping, closing? and not raising till they came to hammer. That was the give away. Actually, he had killed with an ice pick. And this was not made public. Nobody else knew except the killer and the police. They had withheld this information. But when they confronted him with these four choices, the moment that he said ice pick, there was a jerk. And he did. The body language is very, very useful. What I'm going to do is to take you to one more, one or two more little questions which might be useful for you in your domestic situations. Okay, now please take a look at this. If I ask you these questions, I'll take the first question, not this one. Okay. Have you ever cheated any exam? You ask a friend. You'll find if that person has cheated, a gentle yes and then a no. It might be a big no, but before that, unconsciously, there'd be a slight no. Catch that. You must be, as a teacher, as a professor, whatever it is, you must be alert to what happens around you. He'll say yes. And take the next one. I'll just shift this one. Was any of your answer during the admission interview consciously false? It's difficult to say no. Don't ask them one after the other. Give them a pause because the mind gets into the rhythm. Give them sufficient pause and ask the next question. Was any of your answer in the interview consciously false? Uh, no. Yeah, you got it. And third one, and my favorite one, this is, I like to ask you every time. Was there an occasion when you traveled without a valid ticket? You asked them in a public place when everybody's sitting. And then <laughs> very few will be able to say yes. These are giveaways. Use your language to learn a lot. Look at this. Ah, yes. Now I'm going to ask you another question, if you have understood this. Try to answer it yourself now. I'm going to ask you a question. The question is, look at this. Do you like the, this lecture on forensic linguistics? And I want you to say, yes, of course, and say, no, with your head. 
Do you like this lecture on forensic linguistics? Yes. Uh, difficult, isn't it? Now try the other way around. Do you like this lecture on forensic linguistics? Sit down. You say, do no with your head and say yes, of course. It will crash. The body never dies. That's what I want to show. There are many other things that I have uh, done, but I'm not going to do this. The not test will tell you a lot of interesting things. Now, how to understand body language? I'm not going to run through this one, but I'm going to give six common features. This is anger, exaggerated. How to detect if somebody is angry? Look at those symbols. Look at those signs. If you can find that, you will know that that person is... No, I'll take another one. Yeah. This is anger, right? Disgust. Right? I'm going fast. Sorry. Contempt. You learn these basic emotions, how they are expressed. You know how to control them. You know how to detect them. Linguistic hermeneutics or body language hermeneutics. This is interesting. Ah, this is happiness, right? Joy. I'll take one more. Contempt. Yeah, okay. We will have to rush through this. We have a very famous quiz. Or I think called Friend of Four. Some of you might have watched it. Where there is a quiz. Very interesting quiz. And every right answer gives you, let's say, 100 points. And when you are finishing and going away, it is possible. It is possible for you to take the money with you on these three conditions. The two of you who have formed a, a pair to answer these questions will come out. And if one declares himself a friend and the other four, the four gets the money. If both of you are friends, both get 50-50. If both say you are foes, all the money goes to me, the master. Okay? This was done. I want you to watch it and tell me whether this person is lying or not or why do you see it. Andrew, Gina, you guys know your options? Let me remind you of a couple things. Gina steals from her own son's piggy bank. Is she going to break your bank, Yanju? And Yanju, he likes to get naked. Is he going to leave you hanging out there as well? I'm going to give you each some sacred time to make your case to your teammates. Gina, you go first. Okay, well, I'd like to say that was that money in that piggy bank came from my dresser <laughs> because my son likes to steal out of my dresser. So we just use it for donuts. It's really not that bad. <laughs> it's for him. <laughs> oh, yeah, that says it all. Yeah. We really worked well as a team. We're both in education, very little money. Let's both go home happy. Oh, all right. Well, the moment of truth is at hand, you guys. I, uh, I know this is a lot of money. I want you guys to think about this very carefully as you each slip a hand into the trust box because it is time to choose friend or foe. I'm stopping here. You're listening to these two fellows. They have got about 6,800 pounds to share among themselves. If they say both of them are friends, they can split it. If one of them says he's a foe, he will get all. If they say they are friends both, they will get it. Yeah. What do you think is going to happen. You listen to them, you look at them. Now, I want you to type in the in the chat box. Do you think it is friend, friend, or friend, foe? Or who do you think the man will let down the woman, or the woman will let down the man? Just type it. Let us see. Let us see the results. How smart you are. Just try it for Exit, this is no exam. All right, I presume you have done. Let us see the answer.
Jeannie, young Jim, please take your hand out of the trust box. Place your hands on the table. Looks good to me. Young Jim, how do you think she voted? Friend. Really? Yes. What makes you think so? Her eyes. How do you think he voted? I think he voted friend. All right, $6,200 is up for grabs, you guys. Let's find out. Your friend or foe? Gina, you went friend. Stay true to your Yanju, let's see what you picked. Yanju, you went foe. Oh, you went foe. Oh, oh, you're taking $6,200. You're taking $3,200 in this first. Did you? You came for money. Oh my gosh. Oh. You came for money and you took it from the honey. <laughs> I think we could go on and on, but now for the present, let us uh, stop with this. Uh, what do you say, Katie, or whoever is monitoring this? Can we stop now? We have uh, not much time. Am I right? Yes, Father. Uh, if there are any, any suggestions, questions, or any ideas, I would be. Happy to listen to you. Shall we have a few questions? Why not? Over to Francis. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time on the game where knowledge can Thank you, Reverend Dr. Peter, for the insightful and uh, interactive session. Perhaps uh, Richard II couldn't put up, put up with the turbulent priest, but we were eager to go on and on with this exuberant priest. You did really force us to think out of linguistic box and infuse into us newer perspectives on communication. Context makes the meaning and not the words. Certainly right. We experienced it in the hands-on training you gave us throughout the session. We understand that any simple discourse could be a complex entity and a complex one simpler if we could observe the various linguistic elements and their interplay in the creation of meanings. That was a, a really powerful session, Father. Thank you. Uh, yes, and you have uh, lots of uh, good reviews coming up. They are, they, they're enjoying your uh, session. Many people are saying it's very interesting, wonderful, and they're very happy to listen from you. And um, let me give you one or two questions, Father. So, Father, do you think uh, functional and forensic linguistics should be made part of our curriculum? If so, what are the aspects that can be introduced or incorporated? I don't know. It's up to the colleges. I'm only trying to disturb you. It is a disruptive thinking that I face. Why not is my job? How is your job? What could be done? You know, make uh, linguistics is hated subject. Let us accept. And it is so mechanically boring. Can we make it? We need to understand a good grounding of grammar, dialectology. We need to understand stylistics, some basics of this. And after that, if you introduce these kind of a, there are, Dime a dozen, so much that can be done. If I can give you a passage and say, tell me what's wrong with this. Tell me, can you detect what sort of a profile can you derive from this writing, from this speech? It would be easy, it would be interesting. It could do it in your vernacular. It could do it in English. I, I think we could start with the workshop. And if it works out, you can make it into a two days. As a matter of fact, I've been invited to do for, a, for the, some of the uh, firms and companies around a workshop on forensic linguistics. And for another one is for interview techniques, behavioral interview questions. How to tackle them, how to get them. You know, many of the things are in print when you give them your CV. Repeating the same question, where were you born? What did you study? I mean, come on, it is all there. Don't ask what you can easily find in your scene. Ask questions that are not recorded there, but perhaps they don't know. In such a situation, what would you do? If this happens, what would you do? And that will reveal his inner core personality. That is what cannot be captured in paper. 
And that is the kind of a training we need to do. And that's the moral, ethical, honest way of doing it. Yes, uh, thank you. Just going to be tried out. It will be difficult, but not impossible. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And you did uh, connect with the different branches of linguistics. So here someone is asking a question. How do you differentiate forensic linguistics uh, from neurolinguistics or semiotics or deconstruction? Are they interconnected or are they different? No, you are comparing apples with oranges. Uh, it's difficult. I, I know neurolinguistics techniques can be used here. Neurolinguistics Testing, for example, it simply says that you, your feeling is expressed in your language and in your body language. By the way, you look up. When I asked you, you said, what did you have for breakfast this morning? If you are recalling, your eyes would go upwards, right? And if you are imagining, it will go the other direction. These are all techniques you can borrow. As I said, this is a subject that cannot be looked up in silos. Borrow from everyone, psychology, sociology, anything, linguistics, language, neuroscience. You forgot the neuroscience. Neuroscience has got an excellent prospect. Move out of the beaten track. Take the less traveled road. We can, we need to put our heads together and work out something. As far there's one more question which is a little more related as well as general that would benefit all of us since you are a great presenter. And this question you would be able to tell us how to reduce too many verbalized pauses while making presentations. I think we should learn that from you. Yes, Father. Pauses you. Can you explain what do you mean verbalized pauses? Uh, maybe making some hum, something like that. Ah. Or, and then stopping. I don't know, maybe that's what. Should you? <laughs> Why are you bothered about it? Tell me a native speaker who doesn't pause, who doesn't um and uh, yes. A good question requires thinking. If he blurts out, that means it is unthought kind of question. If somebody does, uh, yes, right, it's good, but not repeating it. No. Many of the proofs that I gave there about repetition and all is never to be taken in isolation. It is a cluster of clues that will add up. Because you repeated, you are lying. No. That is one of the indicators. Look for the cluster of indicators. The first answer would be giveaway. You just said, ah, if supposing somebody asked me a question, I go up like this, he said, is he lying? No. There could be so many other factors. We need to think of it. To hesitate, to, we can't speak like a, like a recorded one. In the films, you have uninterrupted, no error, uh, um, because they have 18 takes. I have stood in these places. How many takes? Take one, take two, take three, take four. How many things? Scene one, scene one. These are all how it is. The natural speech is spontaneous. Spontaneous speech is idiotic, and each one has got his way. So what? If it is too much, like somebody says so, so on and so forth, or a CC, a CC, or some kind of a mannerism, that can be corrected. Or if it yes. doesn't amount into a mannerism, forget it. Enjoy it. Be yourself. Uh, yes, Father. So one last question. As a language person, we can only make a guess. Can we be that accurate in detecting information, particularly in crime investigations? No. Thank you for that question. These are only supplementing many other things. If you go to the cases, I've gone to many other forensic cases. They supplement other scientific evidences and the computerized analysis and even lie detectors. This supplements. In itself, this cannot be taken as a conclusion. The court rejects uh, forensic linguistics as a final evidence. But this can add, as I told you about this person who said that when he, about the instrument he used for murder, that particular thing, 
gave them a clue. After that, they went and got a search warrant and hunted and found it. This is only indicators. This is not a conclusive evidence now. But thanks for that question. That was nice. Great, Father. Uh, thank you, Reverend Dr. Peter M. Francis S.J., for the insightful sharing and interactive activities, and we are on time. Thank you, dear participants, for your lively involvement. Before we begin the next session, I shall share with you some important instructions. When we use Zoom, a maximum of 100 persons only, participants only can be accommodated in the chat room. So we work on a first come, first serve, served basis. Once the Zoom chat room reaches its full capacity, others could get connected to the YouTube live channel. Even those attending the sessions via YouTube live channel will get their attendance as we are monitoring it. The paper presenters who are attending the third session from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. may leave the plenary session at 2.55 p.m. and join the paper presentation session. You may also leave earlier than that to join the paper presentation session. There is no hard and fast rule that you should join the paper presentation session before 20 minutes. Do not get discouraged when you are unable to enter a particular paper presentation room. It could be because too many people may be trying to enter the same room at the same time. So keep trying. From our side, we are more than happy to allow any number of participants as audience into the paper presentation rooms. The link to the feedback form will be shared with you after 4 p.m., both on YouTube, live channel, and Telegram. You will be given ample time to fill in and submit. For your kind information, we have stopped accepting new papers for submission or presentation. However, if people would like to join as only participants can register still. Dear participants, we have the next session coming up. Please stay tuned with the same enthusiasm. Over to Dr. David J. Ballon of Loyola College, the moderator of the next session. I welcome him to introduce the resource person, Dr. R.S. Baskarin, and lead the session. Dr. David J. Ballon. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Francis. It was very kind of you for introducing me. I am Dr. David J. Ballon from Loyola College, Chennai. And uh, to start with, good morning to all of you. On behalf of the collaborating institutions of the International Virtual Conference 2020, I extend once again a hearty welcome to all the participants, particularly to the numerous enthusiastic participants who continue to support us through their active participation in all the sessions. So it is this spirit that keeps us motivating to provide you with an uninterrupted live streaming of the conference. Of course, without breaking the timeline of the schedule, we are trying to be in touch with you. I thank Professor Francis for moderating the session of Father Francis. Participants, I would like to tell you, it was just a coincidence that both of them, Mr. Francis and Father Francis, happened to be in the same session. Thank you, Father. It was indeed a treat to all of us. A home without a woman is no home. Similarly, a conference without a discussion on gender issues is no conference. That's my personal opinion. Having been fully aware of this, IBC 20 had taken a conscious effort to include all the vital topics such as this from the gamut of literature for discussion here. In this context, I would like to recall the scholarly presentation we had yesterday by Dr. G. Baskaran on gender controversy in modern Indian writing in English. And today we have, of course, one more Baskaran, and that is not also a coincidence, Dr. R.S. Baskaran to speak on the topic, female masculinities in English literature. What is female masculinity? Is it something paradoxical? Does it make any sense for me? Is it the same meaning that I have in mind? All of us know that the terms feminine and masculine are gender terms in everyday usage and that femininities and masculinities describe gender identities. But what is this female masculinity? What does it mean in gender discourse? 
is it synonymous to masculinity or is it an alternative to femininity does it mean the parallels that exist between females adoption of the traditionally regarded masculine behaviors in the arenas of sex high fashion and music or does it mean the increasing adoption of traditionally masculine behaviors among females and projecting them as highly propagated popular culture well it is this curiosity on these areas that arouses an intense interest in today's topic however i have no intention to disclose anything by way of prelude about the topic today rather i would like the speaker of the day dr r s baskaran to uncover the topic and make you discover the meaning of all the queries that you have in your mind indeed i deem it a great privilege to introduce to you the speaker of this session dr r s baskaran he has been working as professor of english omar al mukhtar university in libya with a brilliant academic career he obtained his ma in english from the university of madras B.A. from Madurai Kamaraj University and Ph.D. from Bharati Dasan University. He has been teaching English for the past 31 years. He was awarded the Best Polytechnic College Teacher Award for the year 2005 by Indian Society for Technical Education System. He has published widely in reputed international and national journals. and presented research papers at numerous international and national conferences he has done these things across africa and asia he is a foreign examiner for phd evaluation for various universities in india and he has the credit of evaluating more than 24 phd theses so with that short introduction about uh, the speaker of the day May I invite the speaker, Dr. R. S. Baskaran, to take over the session? Over to you, sir. Dr. R. S. Baskaran. Dr. R. S. Baskaran, sir. Yes, sir. Please, sir, go on, sir. Please go on. Uh, okay. Good afternoon to everybody. thank you so much professor dr b david jaybalan sir for the very kind and generous introduction A respected vice chancellor professor dr s tamari chelvi madam registrar dr s sayed shafi and convener dr b kadirasan who has given me this wonderful opportunity to present before you all Uh, Lyola College patrons, Reverend Dr. Francis P. Xavier, S.J. Rector, Dr. Reverend Dr. D. Selvan Ayam, S.J. Secretary, Reverend Dr. Y. Thomas, S.J. Principal, Dr. Melchior Gabriel, Deputy Principal, and Convener Professor Dr. K. S. Anthony Swami, Head and P.G. Research Department of English, uh, Lyola College, Chennai. Organizer Dr. David Debon, Sir, Associate Professor. Say Sacred Heart Heart College Patron Dr. Revere Dr. John Alexander S D B Rector and Secretary Revere Dr. Maria Anthony Raj S B S D B Principal Convener Dr. K A Maria R K Raj S D B Additional Principal and Head of the P G and Research Department of English Organizer Yen Arul Das Head of the Department and Dr. Colin Sarun Prakash Sir who has Um, who has 
given uh, a technical assistance. Sacred Court uh, College, Tirupathur. Then Government Tirumagal College, College, Kuriyatam, Petra. As Kaveri Ammar Principal, Convener Dr. P. Vasi, Head and PG Research Department of English, Organizer M. Komadi, etc. I would like to thank my uh, university, Wamar Mukhtar University President, Dr. Abdul Madhulub Ahmed Bafarwa, Vice President, Dr. Mahdi Muhammad Karim, Dr. El Sunusi Atiya Abu Faraj, Director of General Administration of Teaching Faculty, uh, Dean Faraj Sulaiman, Dr. Bizam Elber Fali, HOD Wamar Mukhtar University, Libya who have given permission to represent 59 years old Omar al Mukhtar University. I dedicate this webinar presentation to Almighty, my parents, my teachers, my uh, gurus, Professor Dr. Palani Aran Sami, Dr. K. Rajamanikam Raja Sarfoji Government Arts College, Professor Mir Hadiali, former principal of New College, Professor Donald James, Professor Subramanian of Anomaly University, Professor Krishnamurti of uh, uh, Sastra University. Thank you so much for all. English language studies and its impacts created by fourth industrial revolution brings automation and digitalization. And even to say it is the age of information technology and robotics, of course, it is machine age. Man become machine-like without heart and mercy. Nowadays, human values are lost. Shakespeare and his humanity is need of the hour. Hence, humanity and Shakespeare is an essential because Shakespeare speaks universality and humanity. The whole world is in his 37th place. Shakespeare is still alive in the world through his place. Shakespeare is one of the burners of the world. He says, all the world is stage. All the men and women are merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his lifetime plays many parts. His acts being seven ages, by which he meant that the whole life is like a drama there is nothing in human life that does not find in his place. He wrote during, sorry, um, he wrote during Elizabethan period of England, but he does not belong to any particular place or time, but he belongs to the whole world. Ben Johnson's famous assertion, Shakespeare was not of an age, but for all time. Shakespeare is universal. Now, Shakespeare's humanity is barely required in all walks of life. Shakespeare plays are to be prescribed to all professionals, not only English literature students, but for engineers, doctors, lawyers, and other professionals. The subject can be classified as, I, 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 it's my suggestion, the subjects can be classified as medical in humanity, law in humanity, business in humanity, and so on and so forth. Everyone has to study Shakespeare in order to establish human kindness in everyone's heart. Humanity, humanities are Shakespeare, Shakespeare is humanity. Humanities are Shakespeare, Shakespeare is humanity. Relevance of Shakespeare humanity is in across the country and across the world. All must study Shakespeare. It is a known fact that Shakespeare become global figure in literary world as far back 16th century, even before his counterparts were born. Yet his ideology fits perfectly into the 21st contemporary society. Hamlet, Falstaff, and Cleopatra and other characters are transaction in knowledge. Shakespeare created hundreds of characters for, the, for, for his 37th place. Hence, the great critic of Shakespeare, Harold Bloom, says, Shakespeare is the invention of human. Shakespeare's characters are universal 
and they are flesh and blood. Shakespeare in tragedy teaches character is destiny. A.C. Brownlee's monumental work, Shakespeare in Tragedy, lucidly analyzes the essential features of Shakespeare's tragedy, and he describes as tragic flaw or hamachia, because it leads to the hero's tragedy. The hero has serious defect in his character. It differs from hero to hero. Hamlet's weakness is procrastination and indecisiveness, incapacity to act at the appointed time. Macbeth's weakness is overwhelming ambition. Othello has a childlike credulity. He readily trusts people whom he should not. King Lear's tragic flaw is his impulsiveness, giving away his kingdom to his undeserving daughters. Nowadays, you can see many King Lear's, that is, parents are left in old age homes by their own sons and daughters. So now, we badly repair sexuous humanity. What we have learned from sexuous plays and characters of tragedies, we should not have single flaw in our single flaw or in a or a fault in our character. That would lead us to our downfall. Sexuous says in his place, Julius Caesar, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that were underlings. My focus is towards students and learners. I would like to motivate students how to memorize and by heart Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's The Golden Birds effortlessly by using their mobile downloading video clips related to Shakespeare. And if they listen, students can learn native speakers accent and language. I share my experience how I have memorized these golden lines whenever I travel. I used to listen. I'm going to show you some of the heroes of sexual love. Now you can listen soliloquies of Hamlet. I am going to bring uh, Hamlet here. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against sea of troubles by opposing the end, to die to sleep, no more. And by a thing to say, we end the heartache and thousand natural shocks. That flesh is had to, this, this consummation devotedly to be wished, to die, to sleep, to sleep, the charms to dream. Hey, that is the rub. For in the sleep of death, what dreams may come. When we have shuffled of this mortal coil, must give us pause. There is the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and swans of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's continuity, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that passion made of unworthy takes, when himself might his piteous make with bad bargain. Who would fathers bear to grin and sweat under the very life, the undiscovered country from whose board no traveler returns, puzzles of them, then fly to others, no, not of. Thus, constraints, thus make covers of a sort. And thus, native view of resolution, sickly dwarfed with the pale cost of thought and the enterprises of great pitch and movement. With this regard, that current stand array and lose the name of faction. From Shakespeare, we can learn not only words, but diction, choice of words. Why have I recited these telemetries? in order to motivate students how to buy heart Shakespeare. At the age of 55, I memorize these golden lines. Why not our students? They are very young. Our students can excel native students. What is the teaching of the above soliloquy? No bats, no animal commit suicide, but only human being, especially why students community. Have you had a yes, sparrow give proposal to crow? The proposal is ultimately rejected by Crow. Can Sparrow commit suicide? Not at all. Then why student community? Suicide or nothing. Nothing comes out of nothing, King says King Lear. Shakespeare has written so many plays on love in his comedies, but he still speaks the truth that love is only for stage, not for the real life. Student must understand. Student must focus on the education and goal not on love.
Hence, we must undergo trials and tribulations of our life. We must not commit suicide at any cost. It is against God and nature. Shakespeare discusses the problem and its solution also. If you want to be, uh, have a successful leadership quality, or if you want to become a successful leader like Abdul Kalam, if our we our teaching community want want to create a new leader, so the good leaders are badly in need of our work. So we, our country is death of good leaders. You know, we need a lot of Abdul Kalams for the use of the society. Students can learn from Anthony Arishan and the rhetorical skills like ethos, pathos, logos in the Republic of Plato who advocates about philosopher king. The Republic is a Socratic dialogue authored by Plato 375 BC. Ethos means moral authenticity, telling the truth. Pathos means able to incite by emotional people. Logos means logic or reaction. Leader must take logic behind the decision. The philosopher must possess required, excuse me. Philosopher King must possess required all virtues. The Italian philosopher Machiavelli in his essay, The Prince, advocated the opposite of Plato. The Greek leader, leader uh, 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 actually Machiavelli uh, uh, preaches against Plato. He contradict the all his statement is contradict uh, Plato. The great leader must be a liar. Our politicians are the followers of Machiavelli nowadays. How Antony follows the rhetorical strategy, the art of communicating effectively by using ethos, ethical appeal, pathos, emotional appeal, and logos, logical appeal. I am going to say, I am going to bring Antony lively. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your yes. I come to bury Caesar not to prize him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is off entered with the bone. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus have told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault. And grievously have Caesar answered it. Here on the leave of Brutus and the rest. For Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. He had brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransom did the general coffers fill. Did this him seem Caesar ambitious? When the poor have cried, Caesar had wept. Ambition should be made of sternest stuff. And Brutus says he was ambitious. Yet Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Leopard call, I thrice presented him kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? You, yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withhold you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, the what said to brutish beast, and men have lost the reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pass till it come back to me. The present pandemic, COVID-19, gives you gives ample time for our students and learners can download film version, speeches actor like Marlon Brando, Chartered Heston, uh, if students listen repeatedly, they can memorize effortlessly. I share my experience. So my Libyan students are uh, not like Indian students. I have downloaded these videos. I, I have given to them and I ask them to listen and listen and I ask them to memorize it. Even I ask them to write. So I have succeeded in the task. So as a student, our students must learn those uh, golden words of uh, uh, Shakespeare. Shakespeare has dealt all the field. He says uh, about the philosophical life, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fruits. They have to dusty that out, out brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. 
a poor player that starts and frets is our upon the stage and then he is had no more it is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing what we have learned from the above philosophical lines the passing of time is such a fact for human life our existence that we cannot step out of it even for a second or even for a nanosecond uh, constantly it is passing by the ephemerality of life the transitory nature of life the peace has philosophical tone as well as nihilism of life out out brief candle so life is like a brief candle it just illuminates for only very small amount of time and finally it is put off because tomorrow and to after tomorrow we soon reach the death it's like a uh, reach the death it's like a poor actor who starts and worries for his hour on the stage and then is never heard of life is a story told by an idiot full of noise and emotional disturbance but devoid of meaning we can similar golden lines uh, uh, i can quote from prosperous the tempest uh, prospero speaks in the tempest to we are such a stuff as uh, our dreams are made on and our, uh, we are such a stuff as dreams are made on our little life is rounded with sleep so the the towers the great towers the gorgeous palaces solemn temples the world itself and everyone living in it which will dissolve just as the illusory pageant has dissolved leaving not even a wisp of cloud behind we are all made dreams and our life stretches from sleep before the birth to sleep of the death similar life teaching in shakespeare and impermanence of life shakespeare is a panacea for all the ills of our society he says in hamlet what a piece of work is a man how noble in reason how infinite in faculty in form and moving how express and admirable in action how like an angel in apprehension how like a god the beauty of the world the paragon of animals and yet to me what is this quintessence of dust man delights not me women neither though by your smiling you seem to say so so sexual you can get everything from sexual as flies to wanton boys or be to gods they kill us for their sports grotesque speaks these words as he wanders on the heath after being blinded by conwell and regan great men think alike see the same uh, uh, philosophical tone we can find in john webster john webster says but we are merely the stars tennis ball second banded which way please them so sexual speaks about love love see to hamlet says i loved ophelia 40000 brothers could not with all the quantity of love make up my sum he confronted his uh, uh, with the leotus and he speaks this like that hamlet says not your wit we defy agree agree there is a special providence in the fall of sparrow if it be now it is not to come if it be not to come it will be now if it be not now yet it will come the readiness he saw so we have to face the death at any time so we we must prepare to face it the famous scholar herald bloom says turn him turn him you can get everything from him so i have gone through the syllabus of uh, uh, all the colleges and uh, thrulu university also in loyola college it says revision of shakespeare revision we must have revision scholar must have revision student must have revision of shakespeare student can learn everything from youtube google scholars and so on and so so forth in the technological era is self learning is the best learning let's see the uh, uh, title let, let let my relate to my title female masculinity is an expression of male gender female masculinity in english literature refer ref, reference with shakespeare's plays this is my title such female masculinity is an expression of male gender traits in females such attributes include being autocratic powerful courageous assertive highly manipulative sometimes persuasive excuse me
Uh, audience, can you view uh, my uh, PowerPoint? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It continues, sir. Yes, okay. Female masculinity is the expression of male gender traits in fem females. Excuse me. Such attributes include being autocratic, powerful, courageous, assertive, and highly manipulative, sometimes, sometimes persuasive, and very often dominant and powerful in, in decision making. In the major protagonist of the selected Shakespearean plays, Lady Macbeth in Macbeth, Viola in Twelfth Night, Juliet in Romeo and Juliet, and Portia in The Merchant of Venice reflect an interesting blend of masculine and feminine attributes. They are seen as fully capable of taking up a male role and behavior. Shakespeare's, uh, Shakespeare's ideas about masculinity, what you have to appreciate here is, Shakespeare's dealing with social view of what was traditionally seen as masculine at the time. So let's begin with the lady Macbeth, who defines for us in the play what are ideas of masculinity are? So when we, so when she wants to become more powerful, she does not ask for supernatural spirits to give her greater power. It is quite odd. Instead, what she asked for is to have her femininity taken away and even her female gender to be taken away, to be replaced by male. She says, come you spirits that tempt on mortal thoughts and sex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood, stop up the access and passage to remorse. Come to my woman's breast and take my for gone. So let it be, uh, so you can see she immediately assumes the, that power will be used negatively. It will be used in cruel way, not just any old cruelty. Direst cruelty, the very worst kind you can imagine. This is how she characterizes men. And that is not just because her husband is cruel. You will remember that before he comes to visit her with the news about the witches, she says, yes, I do bear the nature, it is too full of milk of humankind. Milk, full of human kindness. She's not really talking about Macbeth here. She's talking about the ideal of manhood. Man as a warrior, but also man and he exercises his power who is, uses it cruelly. Let us get back what she is saying. Make thick my blood, stop up the access of remorse. Make thick my blood, stop up the access and passage to remorse. Come to my woman's breast and take my milk for God. So the other characteristics of being male, as far as she is concerned, is that men do not feel guilt. They are full of action, but they don't regret what they have done. They just do, do, they don't feel any guilt for it. Come to my woman's breast and take my milk for God. So in this image, men are the opposite of women. Women have breast milk because they nurture, but men instead have poison. God is a kind of poison here. And she is asking the spirits to take out, take out the milk because she, remember she and Macbeth have just lost a child and she is still lactating. She is still producing this milk, but she wants it turned into poison. 
so this is an incredible attack on masculinity it is an it, it, incredible attack on this accept, acceptable accepted view of what successful successful man should be sorry it is an incredible attack on the accepted view of what a successful man should be powerful cruel and lacking in constraints showing no remorse well macbeth also comments on masculinity when lady macbeth wants macbeth to kill dangan he is confu confusing he says i dare do i dare do all that may become man who dares do is none i dare do all that become a man who dares more is none so although men can be cruel and powerful they cannot go against the laws of god all the laws of society particularly in the, any attack on the king so there are rules to be followed and what is interesting here is the word dare and so the idea is man will dare to do as much as he can as long as he knows he can get away with it and no more than that so the men will be cruel they cannot exist outside the laws of society lady macbeth does not accept that she says which thou have which thou esteemest uh which thou have that which thou esteemest the ornament of life and live a covered in thine own esteem in other words will you have the thing that you prize most the crown kingship the ornament of life would you have that or live a covered in your own esteem and it is an extraordinary that this idea of man who is constantly up for review but he just entered into battle he has uh, macbeth has entered into battle he has defeated the norwegian army and he has done it by throwing off his helmet throwing his shield aside attacking the enemy slaughtering them in the description that we had at the beginning of the play but even this is not enough to convince lady macbeth that he is not a coward and underneath that it must be so for macbeth macbeth he also needs to convince himself that he is not coward and if we go back to the word there of his and that is what is uppermost in his mind a real man shows absolutely no fear in this society at least in terms of the way macbeth and lady macbeth view it in this play it is clear that lady macbeth is right to be a loyal to macbeth her husband and to defend him but her assertiveness coupled with their swift actions are mere replacement of not a rival to men's authority however contrary to what some feminist men women would uh, would have well believe that women are controlled and subjugated by their husbands female power exists every man is directly or indirectly under female masculinity sway as wives they have their styles of ruling and exploiting their husband they equally have their various ways of achieving whatever the goals are especially in situation involves cases where they are expected to make decision in decision in life an average woman has, has changes exercising power over her husband a man is allowed by a martial constitution of any society to divert information to his second best the bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh in order to achieve the best result so in in the, uh, almost all over homes uh, the uh, madurai meenachi is ruling <laughs> our wives wives the female masculinity is uh, of course ruling so again i come to uh, lady macbeth macbeth is among the best known sexless plays shows how far a yeah, female could go at exercising that masculine but negative trait <clears throat> in her sorry Uh, uh, macbeth is among the best known sexual plays so how far a female could go at the exercising that masculine but negative traits in her in order to achieve what she wants lady macbeth becomes so instigated uh, and power conscious that she desires a high place for her husband and herself with this assertive tendency 
she causes Macbeth to murder Duncan, uh, the king, and becomes instrumental, rational, and dominant in exhibiting her uh, masculinity traits in diverse ways. Lady Macbeth does not pretend to cover up the fact that she has been the active dictator and controller ruling her husband all along. She not only worries that Macbeth may be too full of milk of human kindness, she knows her husband's weakness because uh, uh, Mac Macbeth is a good man, good hearted man, kind hearted man. So she persuades him to kill Duncan, but also confesses to the fact that her husband is only being weakling who could not hurt a fly and that his nature is too soft to murder or nurse any high ambition. So to Lady Macbeth, her husband is known to many as a brave man, full of ambition, vigorous action, but unfortunately he is a stock weakling. So she says, so to justify her possessive typical masculine traits, she does not hide the fact that Macbeth can only act on her impulse as evidenced in the instant letter Macbeth sends to his wife. Here, Lady Macbeth represents Macbeth's doubt, doubts and fears are the feminine order within him. So, so masculine order is in Lady Macbeth, feminine order is in Macbeth. It is when he returns from his victory over this alliance that he meets with the three witches who profess a great future for him. Immediately, the masculine nature of weird sisters bewitches Macbeth to the extent that he is mesmerized into planning for the inevitable acts. Lady Macbeth to follow the pattern of such a prophecies against the tene of Cowder. She casts her masculine spells on her husband, who decides instantly to covet his master's post. She persuades Mac Macbeth that the only way to become recognized and crowned as the prophesied king is to murder Duncan. Lady Macbeth succeeds in persuading Macbeth to perpetuate the murderous action against the feminine nature of her husband. Also, it is notable that despite she has installed a strategy, Lady Macbeth begins to doubt her husband's firmness and promptness to successfully execute the plan. So even when Macbeth begins to consider begging out the act, we will proceed no further in this business. He had honored me a late of and I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people, which would be one now in the newest glass suit. She instantly persuades him to action, teasing and scolding. How? Teasing, scolding that he is too decent and squeamish to murder Duncan for the crown. From this time, such an account I love. From this time, such an account I love. Art thou afeard? to be the same in thine own act and valor as though in desire and live a covered in thine own esteem. So she further controls Macbeth giving Clemens the what cowder and shall be what the what promised. Lady Macbeth does exercise her masculine order, control over the husband as she directs. Thus thou must do he thee hither that I may pour my spirits in thine ear and chastise with the valor of my tongue. From this, it is glaring that the iron lady asserts her will on her husband, especially with the harsh and authoritative words that pierce through his heart that before then he have described as only one, too full of the milk of kindness, too full of uh, milk of kindness, to the one confessing letter, I have done the deed, is this dagger, deed is dagger, which I see before me, the handle toward my hand, come, let me clutch thee. Further, still in her assertive behavior, Lady Macbeth persuades her husband into killing the king. She encourages and coerces Macbeth to do, to do it. Lady Macbeth eventually dismisses any form of fear or failure in Macbeth. Thus, Macbeth, if he should fail, Lady Macbeth, we fail, but screw your courage to sticking place and we will not fail when Duncan is asleep. 
what cannot you and I perform? Duncan, who shall bear the guilt of our great fall? From this discussion, Lady Macbeth knows immediately that her husband's determination to perpetuate this criminal act has slackened. Even when Macbeth expresses his desire to bow the wicked act, Lady Macbeth, Macbeth adjusts him on. When you just do it, then you are a man. And to be more than what you are, you would be so much more than man. No time, no place did them adhere. And yet you would make both. They have made themselves and their fitness now does and make you. I have given suck and know how tender. Tis to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, I have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums. When you, Lady Macbeth says, when you just do it then, you are a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more man, nor time, nor place, did then adhere, and yet you would make both. Lady Macbeth, again, she says, they have made themselves, and that the fitness now does unmake you. I have given such and know how tender this to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gum and dash the brains out had his one as you have done this done to this lady macbeth's courage to the courage at carrying out her plan is further amplified when she states how easy it would have been even for her to suffer and deprive her most loved son of maternal love and would have plucked her nipple from his boneless gum and dash this brain out had she so sworn Lady Macbeth accuses Macbeth of cowardice and lack of manliness when she discovers that he is already making up his mind against Duncan's murder. She boldly asserts that she would not mind killing her own son rather than breaking any vital promises made in time like this. Lady Macbeth decides to become an active partner in her husband's deadly plan. So she prays, come you spirits and sex me here. Uh, uh, and sex me here. Excuse me. She boldly asserts that she would not mind killing her once and rather breaking my vital promises. Uh, decides to become an active partner in her husband's plan to praise calm you spirit and sex me here and talks of crushing the babe at her breast. Lady Macbeth ultimately embodies the relationship between gender and power by repeatedly speaking seeking to emasculate Macbeth as a strategy to con convince him to murder Duncan. Thus, hesitantly and rather reluctantly, Mac Macbeth succumbs to his wife's urging and assertive will. He starves the king in his bedchamber. Lady Macbeth has succeeded in dragging the attendance of Duncan place. I have dug their faucets that, that death and nature. Uh, again, I quote, I have dragged their faucets that death and nature, unquote. She goes on to convince and instill her fears in him. Thus in case that wife usurps the position which the patriarchal society has stereotypically assigned to husbands. There is a reversal to old which points to the existence of female masculinity in the Renaissance, which was essentially patri patriarchal society. Lady Macbeth has been able to successfully manipulate and browbeat her husband by reversing kind of gender role. He appointed to equality of gender. This point does demonstrate that social identities could exist unaffected by gender ideas. We can compare Kannahi, the heroines of Silapati Haram, written by Ilango Adhikan. Kannahi wrenched her breast and threw towards Madurai and banned the entire city. But on the contrary, Sanctuary dis dis describes Lady Macbeth as an evil incarnation. But Ilango Adhil, on the other hand, elevated Kanahi as a goddess. She flew, flew towards the sky, towards the heaven. It, so uh, Ilango Adhil makes her to, uh, uh, in a, she, he, Ilango Adhil is given goddess status. It is an incredible attack on the accepted view 
uh, again, I have come to uh, Lady Macbeth. It is an incredible attack on the accepted view of what successful man should be powerful, cruel, and lacking in constraints, showing no remorse. We just remind the great Italian philosopher, Machiavelli, advocates in his work, The Prince, how the king should be. Machiavelli is totally different from Plato, the philosopher king, the outstanding Greek philosopher in his famous work, famous work The Republic. Now, the Christian interpretation will argue that it is entirely Lady Macbeth's fault that she chooses evil, she asks for the assistance of murdering ministers, and she is picking here a religious word. So a minister would be somebody connected to the church who would help, but here she is taking that religious language and inventing it and creating murdering ministers in this way. She deliberately seeks the power of witches. She seeks the power of evil. She seeks the power of Satan, if you like. And from Christian perspective, she entirely deserves, deserves to go to hell. From this moment, even before she plans to kill in Dungan, but simply by transfer, trans, transferring her allegiance from God to the murdering ministers, these agents of who supernatural as she deserves to go to hell. Then the imagery conveys how un unnatural this act is because it takes her breast milk and changes, changes her substantially and physically into something else. That is the crime against the nature, crimes against God. As you see, especially when Duncan is killed and that's ultimate crime against nature and God. The top natural hierarchy followed by the angels, followed by church, symbolized by the Pope, and then the kings and the queens who are appointed divinely by God's, God's judgment. Therefore, Lady Macbeth's plan to assassinate Duncan is a crime against nature, an order which is dictated by, again, an unchristian fundamentally, unchristian act because it attacks God directly rather than simple killing of any normal human being. They have picked on the symbol of God's ultimate power on earth, the king, and so from that moment, divine punishment is inevitable. Inevitable. So, Sergius's persuasion of women have been fascinating subject of literature, or literary creative creativity from time immemorial. That they they are perceived from various angles by various writers. Some discuss about the way women are treated, either by the, themselves or by men. While some try to allocate powers to female characters, while trying to negotiate their relationship with others in stories. Shakespeare never fathoms much difference in both genders, even though his society demands different behavioral truths. He creates most of his heroines to deny that behavior, believing that the concept of choice and free will apply as equally to his feminine as well as his masculine character. He, he creates realistic as well as meaningful female char characters who act just like their male counterparts. Of writing, approaching test, because human imagination, imagination is essentially genderless. Shakespeare sees differently his female characters. Portia, Juliet used persistence, coercion, control in assertive ways to dismiss the potential suitors dictated by the society. Viola and Lady Macbeth used coercion to assert bills on their men. Similarly, Merchant of Venice, Portia uses the power of words to rewrite the ending of tragedy, though she does so in male costumes. Without her disguised dress, dress code, her argument would have remained and had by the court. Shakespeare tries to depict women as equally powerful as men, that by questioning the existing, existing traditional stereotype of women, designated as weaker vessel and dislodging the established hierarchies of power or powerlessness of men and women, he thus rendered the relationship between binary opposition unstable as either of the sexes can exercise masculine tribes when necessary. Masculinity has to do 
with the gender ascribed behavior that are part of regular pattern of person not because such a behavior sorry in it but because they are socially accepted to be such not gender based so i can suggest our uh, our students community and the future researcher they can research on shakespeare with a new vision new vision and new ideas so obviously all women examined in the place of shakespeare are very different individual individuals as they all share unique characteristics that the playwright discovered and in some cases important in his heroines each becomes resolute at various points and know her mind despite the fact that the societies of the time demand certain behavioral pattern for instance viola dares the social norms and acts mainly to prove the need for the society society too also accept her as it would be a man whatever the means not withstanding in the play twelfth night this is what happens when viola poshia engages in physical and psychological disguise to achieve their desired wills in order to meet the different needs of the society amidst patriarchal intimidation with the various societies the play romeo and juliet is set within the city of verona where the interest of the patriarchal fathers take supremacy over the daughters choice of lovers it is where masculinity as a war becomes a regime and a dominant system that is held to account for violence and oppression oppression among men uh, thank you so much for the opportunity as given for me by professor dr b kadiresan sir thank you so much sir thank you very much for all the participants to hear my presentation passionately i hope i have been. thank you sir time stipulated time yes sir yes sir yes thank you dr baskaran for the wonderful thank session you. thank and, you so much uh, yeah Uh, we have a few questions before i propose word of thanks i would like to get clarifications for certain questions raised by participants okay. we are been talking about a very familiar character hence there are innumerable questions yes shall i proceed sir with the questions oh uh, please sir yes there is a question from anto maria why do you think there is a disparity regarding reaction of the society towards sexual harassment or abuse of different genders so i i would suggest for all the ills ills of uh, the society uh, i would suggest sexual place is the panacea for uh, all the ills of our society and sexual if you if you go to sexual we can get all the solutions for all our uh, problems of our society yes now there is uh, uh, another question do you really think that that is from dr sujatha menon do you really think lady macbeth is stronger yes of course she no doubt She's... talks a lot she has not completed the question sir she okay. no doubt talks a lot but when asked to kill duncan she is unable to do so saying that duncan resembled her father yes. it is macbeth who killed duncan five yes Finally, is lady macbeth who is an abominable and hallucinator what is your opinion uh, yeah uh, yeah of course uh, duncan seems to be like her father that's why she is unable to execute her uh, plan so she wants to kill duncan when she sees him in the slumber 
she he seems to be her father so she is unable to kill her so he, here her masculinity <laughs> dominated over at that point of time so uh, her, sorry uh, her femininity is dominated over her at the point of time and whenever uh, she sees as if her uh, uh, father figure how can she uh, kill him so she is she is, of course she is stronger uh, or most of the time uh, her masculinity behavior uh, in order to persuade her husband to do uh, the uh, to to kill uh, dangan most of the time he, she seems the dominant uh, uh, masculine uh, character we can see but at the time of uh, uh, killing dangan she is unable to carry out because he, he, he seems to be her father so at that time her um, femininity is dominated over yeah that's true but the question is what prevails finally is she just full of rhetoric uh, uh, of course uh, of course she she is rhetoric she is unable to carry out so would you consider uh, lady macbeth as a perfect example of female masculinity of course most of the most of the time uh, her uh, uh, male the dominance of uh, uh, masculinity male uh, character is do dominated over in her character but some in the at least in, in only one point of time when she is about to kill uh, dangan she is unable uh, unable to carry out her plan uh, uh, of course she is uh, her uh, female masculinity is dominated most of the time until she succeed her goal she persuades her husband to do the act to kill dangan yes i think uh, that was a wonderful answer uh, which actually uh, driven someone to ask you oh. and uh, not mention the name but uh, i think that was well answered and uh, one more person wants to ask you there is uh, another example from shakespeare's characters who has this quality of uh, feminine masculinity Portia, uh, Portia, Viola. Very good, sir. I think uh, that brings us to the end of uh, uh, the question sessions. Of course, there is more of a compliment to you. Okay, plenty of people have appreciated your presentation. There is uh, somebody has uh, mentioned. Okay. and uh, you, a sir. wonderful speech is a clear a research scholar has appreciated by i think probably she must be doing uh, her research on this area okay and someone has appreciated uh, uh, you, the depth of uh, content in your presentation so that brings us to the end of uh, uh, this uh, session and now it is my pleasure to propose you a word of thanks and of course dear participants i am sure that all of us would unequivocally agree that the session has been a very enlightening one and uh, definitely the speaker has kept us mesmerized throughout the session with the example that he had taken up for his elucidation to uh, explicate the topic that is given to him at the end of it i feel like saying wow what a way to connect a modern critical theory with that of shakespeare shakespeare and shakespeare's women characters i believe it is the characters of um, dr baskaran 
who keep uh, the flame of Shakespeare burning even in these modern days. I would call it a perfect example for revisioning Shakespeare. The contemporary literary trend in interpreting okay. Shakespeare for the modern okay. readers. <laughs> With his reference to Lady Macbeth and Carnegie, he has shown how we can, uh, as students of literature and teachers of literature and researchers in literature, can connect and interpret any text in the context of female masculinity. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the lively session on behalf of the collaborating institutions of the conference and the participants. Once again, I thank you and wish you the best in all your endeavors. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Very kind of you. Thank you so much. Sir. Yes, sir. Now, participants, before we break, here are a few reminders to you, which we wish you remember all through these five days. This has been done by Professor Francis. And at the end of the session, it is again my duty to remind you of these things. So these are the things. When we use Zoom, a maximum of 100 participants only can be accommodated in the classroom. So we work on a first come, first served basis. Once the Zoom chat room reaches its full capacity, others could get connected to the YouTube live channel. Even those attending the session via YouTube live channel will get their attendance as we are monitoring it. Those paper presenters who are attending the third session from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. may have the plenary session, may leave the plenary session at 2.55 p.m. itself and join the paper presentation session. You may also leave earlier than that to join the paper presentation session. That is not an issue. There is no hard and fast rule that you should join the paper presentation session before 20 minutes. So keep accompanying the speakers in the plenary session and leave just five minutes before. Do not get discouraged when you are unable to enter a particular paper presentation room. It could be because too many people may be trying to enter the same room at the same time. So keep trying. From our side, we are more than happy to allow any member of participants, any number of participants as audience into the paper presentation rooms. The link to the feedback form will be shared with you after 4 p.m., both on YouTube live channel and Telegram. You'll be given ample time to fill in and submit. I'm sure by now you should be familiar with the feedback form and the timing that you have to adhere to. For your kind information, we have stopped accepting new papers for submission or presentation. However, if people like to find the fully participants, they can register still. So I would like to express finally a word of gratitude to the speaker of the day and the participants for holding their breath, listening to the speaker till the end. And I wish you all the best for the rest of the season. That is tomorrow and day after tomorrow. Thank you, all the best. Thank you, Dr. J. Balan, uh, for your wonderful uh, moderating, moderator, being a moderator. I also thank Professor Baskaran, who gave uh, such a wonderful lecture. And from the convenience, we have a few announcements to make. This is regarding the afternoon session. Due to some personal reasons, the famous writer, uh, Madam Kafula Mavila Pamila could not join us today. So it was uh, rather uh, unfortunate that she couldn't join us today afternoon. So in her place, we wanted somebody from Zambia. So we requested Professor Habimana Cedric. He immediately accepted our invitation and he is going to deliver a lecture in the afternoon. 
So instead of uh, the famous writer, Madam Kafula Mavila Pamila, another famous academician, a former HOD of Ruzungo University, Professor Habimana Cedric would deliver a lecture. So we, the conveners and the organizing team, we profusely thank Professor Habimana Cedric for accepting our invitation. And this arrangement is made by one of the resource persons, Dr. Yasmin Sultana. We also thank her for all the help she did. So please participants note that the afternoon session will be addressed by Professor Habimana Cedric from Rusugo University, the former HOD of English. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, sir. So see you all this afternoon at two o'clock. Thank you one and all. <laughs>